strange old oak tree, the search began. In 1795, three boys found a deep pit built a century before. They were convinced it held something of immense value. The clues uncovered were so tantalizing that men have been digging ever since. Today, two centuries later, the search continues for the buried treasure of Oak Island. One of the world's most elaborate treasure hunts is presently underway on Oak Island off the east coast of Canada. In the 1600s, the waters of Nova Scotia were a haven for pirates, eluding British and Spanish pursuit. Most searchers have assumed the brilliant buccaneer, Captain Kidd, chose Oak Island to conceal a priceless treasure. Others have expected to find Spanish gold plundered from Mexico and South America. Still others believe the lost crown jewels of Marie Antoinette had been buried there. As early as 1720, strange lights had been seen at night on the island's coast. Two fishermen who went out to investigate vanished. So for nearly a century after, everyone kept his distance from the uninhabited island. The mainland farmers considered it taboo. Finally, in 1795, three brave farm boys set out on an adventure which In Search Of has recreated. Daniel McGuinness, the leader, all of 18, was more fascinated than frightened by the specter of danger. He convinced his two best friends to come out and see something peculiar he'd discovered the day before. On an October morning, the island looked friendly, almost inviting. Daniel took them to a great old oak tree. Over a clear depression in the ground reached a curious bare limb, which had been sawed off a long time ago. had obviously been used to hoist something very heavy. Let's dig. It must be pirate treasure. They plan to have it up and be home by lunch. But they hit flagstones set in a circular pattern made of rock not found on the island. This was the first of many puzzling barriers to their search. Ten feet down, they struck what sounded like a wooden treasure chest. But it was instead a platform of very old logs set tight into the pit, caulked with ship's putty. They also noticed pickaxe marks in the hard clay walls. Clearly, they were re-excavating a very old shaft. <laughs> they were careful to be home by dark. Days later, they got down to 20 feet and hit another log platform. There was no way they could have known but this wood has since been carbon dated to 1575, the era of the Spanish conquest. Weeks later, yet another layer at 30 feet, and winter was coming. With only picks and shovels, the boys had dug as deep as they could, but they weren't ready to give up. They convinced their neighbors that what they had found could make them all rich. In the next few years, a doctor named Simeon Linz raised enough money for a major excavation. Whoa! Whoa! Back over there! Whoa! Back! Whoa! Back! 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 Every 
every 10 feet, they struck another log platform with layers of charcoal and ship's putty, all the way down to 90 feet. If there were treasure, it was buried not only deep, but ingeniously. It was late one day when they found the strangest clue of all. they were onto something important. But the letters were like none they had ever seen. Was it a sign they were close to the treasure or a warning? They worked very late that evening and finally, probing at 98 feet, heard the welcome sound of a large hollow vault. Night forced a halt. Returning at daybreak, they fully anticipated being rewarded for what had become eight years of hard labor. Their expectations were to be thwarted, however, by a diabolical trap that waited in the pit. feet down, Guinness had fallen into water. At least 60 feet of water had somehow filled the pit during the night. The treasure they had almost touched now seemed as far away as the moon. Yet a half century later, the inscription on the stone would be decoded to read, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. This promise of wealth inspired the next search group. When pumping failed to lower the water level, they sent down test drills. Samples from the drill indicated two large chests encased in cement. The men on the surface could hear loose metal rattling around inside the chests. And then one small fragment came up. The engineer wrote in his report, three gold links resembling an ancient watch chain. For the first time, here was evidence of fabulous wealth. In 1850, another search group noticed the water in the money pit rose and fell with the tides. Exploring at nearby Smith's Cove, they discovered stone-lined drainage channels leading towards shore. And even more bizarre, tons of coconut husk fiber, like a blanket under the entire beach. This giant man-made sponge kept ocean water flowing into the channels. But the nearest coconut tree was 2,000 miles away. Their hopes of blocking the water went out with the first tide. Frederick Blair, a Nova Scotia insurance salesman formed another search party in 1893. Their worst suspicions were confirmed. They found the stone channels led all the way from the beach to the money pit. No wonder they could never pump it dry. charge seemed to blast through into a subterranean cavity. They hoped this had finally stopped the flow of water. To check the results, they poured concentrated dye into the money pit and kept a close watch on the shoreline. The dye came up, but to their amazement, on both sides of the island. 
they finally realized the entire island had been engineered to continually flood the money pit. By the end of the 19th century, it's recorded that two workmen had died and the diabolically designed money pit still kept its secret. The next century would bring even more provocative clues and greater tragedy. For 300 years, Oak Island has been a focal point for greed and curiosity. Since Daniel McGinnis discovered the money pit, men have spent more than two million dollars digging for the treasure, unsuccessfully. Perhaps as intriguing as the treasure itself is the question, who took such elaborate means to conceal it? Maybe Blackbeard had Oak Island in mind when he boasted, I've buried my treasure where none but Satan and myself can find it. Before he could recover it, however, he met an untimely death. All that coconut fiber suggests South America. One theory holds that a Spanish galleon wrecked on Oak Island had to conceal a fortune in Mayan or Inca gold. Others believe the lost crown jewels of France were buried here. When Marie Antoinette was guillotined, it's known that her lady-in-waiting escaped across the Atlantic to Nova Scotia. One search party in 1909 was convinced of this theory. Among the diggers, a young lawyer on his summer vacation, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Recent scholarship, however, has proven the jewels never left France. In 1937, Gilbert Hedden, a New Jersey millionaire, came upon what appeared to be an authentic treasure map. In an obscure book called Captain Kidd and His Skeleton Island, he found a map that curiously resembled Oak Island. But more important, it included specific bearings and measurements. Amos Noss worked for Hedden that year. He recalls how they studied the kid map and searched the underbrush south of the money pit. I could have taken a shovel, and I went down, boy, it was hot. <laughs> Flies, mosquitoes, and things bother you. But anyhow, I uh, went around. He told me it was in 50 feet or so, where he thought it was. So I kept trying and trying, and finally I, I struck a rock. Two or three rocks. I kept trying with the pick, you know. And I tore up the sod, which was about, I don't know, probably four or five inches over the top of the stone. And I uncovered the thing. I went up one side, and I knew I had something then. I got to the point there was none any further, so I came back on the other side, and I had what he was looking for. Noss had uncovered a large triangle of stones. George Bates was on the survey crew that rushed to the island to check out this discovery. Would the stone triangle correlate with the kid map? They sighted from boreholes found in two large boulders. Then, they took exact readings from the map, which used the old English system of rods. 18 west and by 7 east on rock, 30 southwest, took them precisely to the stone triangle. Then, 14 north, tree. The triangle pointed exactly due north, towards the money pit. This seemed to confirm that uh, the kid map did mean the treasure was in the vicinity. Then, events took a bizarre turn. The book's author came forward and claimed that he had fabricated the kid map. Was he trying to conceal his sources? Or was the correlation between the map and Oak Island really an incredible coincidence? Because if that were the case, the money pit itself could be a complete hoax. Montreal journalist Darcy O'Connor is considered the leading expert on the Oak Island enigma. I have seen 
uh, the coconut fiber that has been brought up. I have seen reports by the Smithsonian and by uh, independent botanists stating it's definitely coconut fiber. I have seen carbon dating results that Triton has gotten showing that it's several hundred years old, that it's not glacial wood they're finding under the ground, that the metal they're finding is uh, pre-1750 and it's coming deep from under the ground. So there's no possible way it's a natural phenomenon or a hoax. Someone was there at some time and I can only assume to bury something of great value. 92-year-old Mel Chapel bought Oak Island in 1950 because he's also convinced of the existence of a treasure. He's intrigued by what his father discovered in the money pit in 1897. Uh, well, when, uh, when his chisel drill that they, they were using uh, and counted at around 153 feet, uh, what appeared to be stone or concrete for a few inches, then underneath wood, and they pulled the chisel drill up and put on an auger and bored through five inches of wood. The chips came up, and when they pulled up the auger, this little fuzzy stuff was on the screw of the auger, and uh, when they washed it out and cleaned it up and straightened out, it turned out to be this piece of parchment. Mel Chapel preserved this fragment of parchment no larger than a dime. Clearly, there is writing on it. Such clues have sustained belief in a buried treasure. And my opinion, and his opinion, was that it is of immense value, whatever it is. In 1959, Chapel leased treasure trove rights to Robert Restall and his wife Mildred. They gave up their careers as circus daredevils to move to the island, where Restall was convinced he would find the treasure and make a fortune for his family. He had no wealthy backers and no elaborate equipment. But his obsession carried him and his two boys through six years of back-breaking toil. Restall and his older son would work all day and talk about pirates all night. They became driven, mesmerized by the prospect of treasure. Mrs. Restall recalls their isolated life. Well, you had to draw your water from a pond. And of course, no electricity, no radio, no television. We had acetylene lamps. And we had a gas stove for cooking. And that's it. And I was closer to my boys because of our isolation than I would have been living on the mainland not mother and sons. We all became friends to one another. August 17th, 1965. An old pump was draining a 27-foot shaft. No one knows for sure, but deadly carbon monoxide may have collected in the pit. <coughs> Robert Restall was starting down when he suddenly became dizzy. <laughs> Bobby thought his father had suffered a heart attack and rushed down to save him. Two other workmen failed to realize what was wrong and also toppled in. Now to get up and be careful, be careful. The autopsy report read, death by drowning. Mildred Restall now lives alone, still within sight of Oak Island. The time I was up in the cabin, and I know it was after lunch, and I was expecting my husband to come up any time. And um, Rick came home, came back to the cabin, past the one that I was in, and went to his own cabin, the one he shared with his brother. And I thought that was rather odd. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he come in and tell me that my husband would be up soon or something? And I waited a few minutes and then went down and... Um, but by, by then it was all over. And um, I, that's when I learned that my husband and son and two other men were dead. I have an idea that he thinks, at least at that time, he thought he was pretty close. And what, what he thought and what it was, I don't know. He didn't tell me. I didn't ask.
Three days after the Restall tragedy, a California mining conglomerate moved in. The death toll had reached six. Disregarding the local legend that one more must die, this company and its successors continue the search. After 300 years, the secret of Oak Island has eluded all the resources of modern technology. But treasure hunters persist. The present company has dug down to 230 feet and is prepared to spend three million dollars scooping out the entire end of the island if necessary. Whether it's one man with a pick and shovel or a giant corporation with dynamite and bulldozers, an unflagging obsession has drawn treasure hunters to Oak Island. Whoever conceived and executed the fiendish money pit so far has managed to outwit them all. Vikings. The word calls up images of giants, grim warriors and fearless sailors capable of bravery and barbarism in equal measure. They hail from the Scandinavian countries now known as Norway, Sweden and Denmark. The bleak, mountainous interiors of their homelands made them an outward-looking people from the start. At the beginning of the Middle Ages, they began pushing their longboats out from the fjords, scanning the horizons for precious land and sources of trade, and terrorizing the hapless Europeans who stood in their way. For more than 500 years, they swept into Europe, east, south, and west. The westward-looking Norwegians would move stepwise across the Atlantic, from the British Isles to Iceland to Greenland, and finally to a mysterious place called Vinland, somewhere in America. Every schoolchild knows that the rogue Viking Leif Erikson set foot in the New World long before Columbus's historic voyage. But until recently, just how the Scandinavians managed this navigational feat remained a mystery. The questions persist. Did they try to colonize the Americas? And how much of their seafaring skill did they bequeath to medieval Europe? Well, the more I've sailed in, in these small, after all small and open ships, the more respect I, I, I have gotten for, for these people. They were extremely brave. They must have been very, very clever. Uh, uh, shipbuilders, sailors, navigators, they must have been very well organized and so, so uh, I mean, they were fantastic. Ragnar Thorseth, adventurer from Norway, knows the seafaring ways of the Vikings as intimately as anyone. For the last decade, Thorseth had dedicated himself to building replicas of Viking ships and sailing them round the world. What we have been interested in is to to learn as much as possible about the ship, uh, seaworthiness, um, speed, uh, and of course to learn how to to sail them, so that we better can understand how it was possible for the Vikings to not only to sail once across the North Atlantic, but to cross it regularly 1,000 years ago. The archaeology of boats is a relatively new frontier in the science of the past. Working with scholars from the Viking ship museums in Norway and Denmark, Ragnar has tried to remain as faithful to the original Viking shipbuilding craft as possible. What is unique for, for, for Scandinavia, Scandinavian shipbuilding at that time is the clink building technique. Um, most ships are, today, are, the planks are, are like this, but the Viking ships, it's more like this, and then they are nailed together. And, and you first you build up the ships with the planking and then later on you put in the ribs while uh, uh, in most other traditions they do, do it the opposite way. Thorseth's fleet consists of replicas of three ships. Gaia, a copy of the largest Viking ship yet found, built in 850 AD as a raiding vessel and probably once the property of a king. The Oseberg, 
A copy of a royal yacht dating from about 800 AD is the most elegant of the Viking ships. The original was built for protected waters and never meant to see the high seas. The Saga Sigla, the most seaworthy of the three vessels, is an 11th century Viking trader. Well, if I were to cross the North Atlantic again, I would go for the Saga Sigla, the Knorr. But if I were to compete in America's Cup, I would go for the Gaia. Beautiful, fast ship, really. The story of the Vikings' expansion is intimately connected to the characteristics of the land they inhabited, the conditions that drove them outwards. Europe was helpless against the pagan horde. Wielding axes and swords with gruesome skill, the Vikings knew no reason to spare civilians, women and children from their attacks. They ventured as far south as Spain, perhaps even sailing occasionally into the Mediterranean. In the ninth century, they grew strong enough to sack London and lay siege to Paris. They settled parts of Ireland, northern England, and conquered the city of York. Well, I think we've completely revolutionized people's idea of the Viking era in York. People used to think of the Vikings coming and just destroying the city, but we've seen a picture where they come and they inject new life into the place and they lay it out with the streets and the properties and the churches and the buildings, which you can still see today. The lines of the properties still exist a thousand years after, but they have their origin in the Viking Age. So the Vikings came as traders and as merchants and they gave York new economic life. there they struck out ever westward. The Faroe Islands, Iceland, Greenland, in the process they became learned seamen. We are pretty sure that they were able to establish the latitude they were on and that, that they would follow the latitude. Um, we are pretty sure that they had a sun compass to help them establish uh, the latitude. We also know that they were well familiar with the with the planets with the stars for instance the polar star they called called that the leading star so they would always kn know the true north uh, and of course any time when it was clear weather they would have the sun and the moon and the other planets um, the problems i guess uh, came up when uh, they for many days had bad weather and couldn't see the this the sky then they could get lost and uh, but that was actually a good thing too, because the first man to, to get a sight of Greenland, he, he was lost. And also the first man, according to the tradition at least, to, to, to get the sight of uh, Vinland or America. He was on his way from Norway to Greenland and he got lost in a storm. And so... <laughs> The source for those westward journeys are two sagas, both of which tell of the volatile clan of Eric the Red. Theirs is a tale of discovery driven by violence and exile. Eric's father, exiled from Norway on charges of manslaughter, took his family to Iceland. Eric himself, exiled from Iceland after several fights and killings, set off in 986 to settle on the island of Greenland. Eventually, the colony would grow to several thousand settlers. It conducted brisk trade with Europe for several centuries. Uh, Greenland was a rich country. It had many resources which Europe wanted in the medieval period. Uh, things as prosaic as walrus hide, which were used for ships' ropes, uh, through things as mysterious as narwhal tusk, uh, which uh, throughout medieval Europe uh, was considered to be uh, the unicorn horn, the horn of this uh, sort of very mystical and uh, mythical uh, beast. The main commodity, however, was ivory. And uh, walrus ivory from the, the tusks of the walrus that uh, lived in uh, more northerly waters of Greenland was the main form in which uh, tributes and various tides were uh, paid to Europe by the Greenlanders. The 
Vikings continued to look westward across the Atlantic. According to the saga of the Greenlanders, one Bjarni Herofsson was driven off course while trying to reach Greenland and sighted North America in 986. He did not go ashore, but he carried the knowledge of the continent back to Greenland. In about 1000, Eric the Red Sun, Life, decided to strike out for the mysterious westward land to see if it might be suitable for colonization. According to the sagas, Life's expedition first happened upon a barren landscape backdropped by mountains and glaciers. Life dubbed the place Helund, or land of flat rocks. Scholars believe this to be Baffin Island. Sailing southward, they then pulled ashore on a wooded place with a gently sloping shoreline and broad white beaches. This they named Markland, or land of the forest. It was probably Labrador. Then to the south of that was a third land, which they called Vinland. And this is the one that the questions are about. Uh, we don't know exactly where Vinland was, except that it was somewhere to the south of, of Labrador. For years, scholars have debated the truth of the sagas and the location of Vinland, even the meaning of the term Vinland. <laughs> He spoke then the Norse language and said, I have something new to tell you. I found wines and grapes. The name Vinland was given to the land by Leif Erikson uh, in the sagas uh, because, as he said, because of the good qualities that it has. Now, this has been a controversy in scholarship ever since because uh, people want to, in uh, modern uh, days, see it as V-I-N with an accent on the I, Vinland, meaning land of wine or land of grapevines. But in Leif Erikson's time, they really had no knowledge of grapevines or wine. Uh, there was an old Norse word, uh, V-I-N without the accent, Vinland, which referred to pasture pasture land and in fact uh, any Norse explorer finding a new land would have had as his first priority to find pasture land they lived on their cattle they carried cattle with them in their ships as they went exploring and their first priority was find a place for the cattle to graze. Well, Norse people would settle in a, in a land where, where their old pattern of culture fitted I mean, in Newfoundland, they would find what they were used to, hunting seals, hunting caribou, and all that stuff. And uh, furthermore, it was very important to stop in time, don't sail too long. Because I lived in the wilds for many, many years in the northern part, and, and the preparations for the winter, on that depends life and death. They had to build houses, they had to hunt, they had to fish, and prepare for the winter. It was here in northern Newfoundland that the definitive evidence was finally found. Norwegian archaeologists Helga and Anna Stina Ingstad spent the better part of a decade sailing up and down the Atlantic coast of North America looking for clues of the Vikings. In 1961 they arrived at Lance or Meadows. Dr. Ingstad is a Norwegian explorer, but his wife, Anastina, was the archaeologist. And they arrived in Lansom Meadows by accident, really, and they met with the local spokesman of the community, Mr. George Decker. Dr. Ingstad asked Mr. Decker if there was anything unusual, any humps or bumps or mounds around, and Mr. Decker said, yes, there are some Indian campsites up by Black Duck Brook. And there it was. Even if it was so overgrown as it was, and it was made very clear that it was remains of old houses. But uh, I didn't know, of course, who had built these houses. They might have been Indians, they might have been Eskimos, they might have been fishermen, it might have been whalers, and at last it might have been Norsemen. Only uh, excavation could tell the story. But personally, I had a, I had a strong feeling from my experience in Greenland and 
in the western part of Norway that this was the place that the Norse people would like to build their homes. The Viking presence on North American soil some 500 years before the voyages of Christopher Columbus has now been definitively established at Lonceau Meadows. How is it possible then that such a monumental discovery would gradually fade from memory that by the time of Columbus the notion of sailing off the edge of the world would again lurk in the imaginations of European explorers? The answer? It probably didn't. In 1957, Yale University acquired a rather stunning map dating from the mid-1400s. On its western extremity appears the island of Vinland, 400 years after life's journey and 50 before Columbus's. If authentic, the map proves that the reality of transatlantic crossing was still present in the minds of Europeans. Part of the controversy about the Vinland map is a question of its provenance. Uh, there are speculations that it did actually come from a Spanish library uh, in a private family library uh, that uh, was uh, perhaps uh, trying to avoid the Spanish regulation on exporting antiques, antiquities. Indeed. The map raised such intriguing questions that several scholars sought a simpler answer. It was a forgery. And close examination revealed that the ink on the document contained titanium oxide, a chemical available only in the 20th century. But I've shown a way that there could have been a transfer of this titanium dioxide into the ink in modern times as an accidental transfer during cleaning. In the mid-1950s, tissue paper of some manufacturer for a few years did contain commercial titanium dioxide, exactly the material that has been found in the map. There is, however, reason to believe the map authentic. On the upper left-hand corner is inscribed a long secret message in code, a cryptogram. The discovery of the cryptogram in the inscriptions of the Vinland map shows that someone went to an awful lot of trouble to incorporate these cryptograms in the inscription. One does not create a cryptogram hidden in an inscription except by an awful lot of very hard retrying work and uh, just one change of one word in this inscription could destroy the structure of the entire cryptogram. For a forger to go to all the effort to incorporate two cryptograms in two separate inscriptions in the map is very difficult for me to imagine. If the map is indeed authentic, it testifies that the Vikings had lost nothing of their navigational skills in the years preceding the momentous voyages of Columbus. Uh, Columbus did definitely know about the Vikings and their voyages to, to North, North America. Remember that Columbus was born less than 50 years after the last Viking ship sailed with, with, um, yeah, from Norway to Greenland. Uh, we also know that Columbus was in Bristol when he was a young sailor and uh, Bristol was an important harbor and they had lots of ships sailing up to Iceland and also to Greenland. Uh, so the Viking voyages, it was a living tradition. Um, some people also, or some science also say that Columbus went to Iceland so he, he most definitely knew that there were uh, land on the other side of the big ocean. Mm. Greenland has discovered or sailed to America. Greenland was, was uh, colonized from Iceland. And so when we think America being found by Europeans, there are mainly Greenlanders who sailed from Greenland to the continent of America. We don't speak of Christopher Columbus in this country. 
the Indians were there a long time before both Columbus and the Vikings. So uh, the Vikings were probably the first Europeans in uh, in North America. Um, but I mean, they were there for a short period. Columbus, of course, uh, opened up America for the Europeans. It is too easy in this day and age to forget the true magnitude of the Vikings' achievements, to underestimate the elemental forces they challenged. But Ragnar Thorseth is not likely to forget. In May 1992, the valiant trader, the Saga Sigla, and the elegant royal yacht Orzeberg, founded in a sudden storm off the coast of Spain. Luckier than their Viking forebears, the crew survived to tell the tale and to build and sail Viking ships once again. What extraordinarily brave men they must have been, pushing their open longboats into the fjords of Scandinavia, setting sail for unknown hostile lands. An epic saga in themselves, these voyages wrote a heroic prelude to the European Age of Discovery. Leaving one to ponder, will we ever know the extent of the debt that Columbus owed his Viking predecessors? <laughs>